Hi YouTube, this is uh, Mochismo Eugene. This is another video on an exit strategy in the narcissistic personality disorder relationship. I'm going to show you ways that I myself became aware and uh, just, you know, uh, as I was in the relationship, whatever you want to call it, I uh, began to form and devise exit strategies. And in my videos, I'm talking about a lot of other things, but that's the premise of the channel. So, had a lot going on, watching YouTube on here, researching certain things. I like to study. Uh, if something intrigues me or it, it grabs my interest, uh, I weld for a hobby, and I went to uh, junior college for it, and uh, I'm also a landscape uh, operate excavator. Do anything mechanical that uses the brain and your physical faculties in conjunction together, which I think is a good thing. Not just using your brain, but use your physical uh, faculties as well. Use them together, not just be book smart and not being able to physically apply it to life. Now today, well, I just want to wish everybody well today because uh, I went in four days straight on Valentine's Day and for good reason. Uh, doesn't appeal to me like it once did. Uh, nor does a lot of other holidays, but does that mean I'm a humbug? No, it means I take every day uh, with a level of humility. I take every day, and I haven't always been this way, but I'm speaking of now in the present. I take every day with appreciation. I don't look at what the day is not for me. I just look at what it is and, and what it can potentially be, especially when you wake up. You can wake up and something isn't going right, but the day's not over. So always keep that in mind. Wake up with a little bit of gratitude. And so I just want to wish everybody well today. And I know I've gone in hard four days on the Valentine's Day. Uh, my celebration, a holiday coming up. So uh, to people who embrace this, just like they do, you do other holidays, you don't have to feel put off because you still embrace these days. Like I said in my last video, I believe, you know, a narcissist, they ruin everything. Everything good and, and uh, harmonizing, they create chaos around it. So when you learn about these people, uh, these monsters, now you have to look at holidays, or you're almost forced to look at holidays a whole different way. You don't look at them the same. So, uh, I know I came off a little hard about it, and I just want people who are healing and survivors to know that I'm never actually attacking, not even the narcissist, I'm not even attacking them. What am, I, what am I addressing? I'm addressing the diabolical, disturbing, demonic uh, movement that is taking on our world. And for that, I'm not apologizing. For that, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't need validation. I will, until there's no breath left for me, uh, deal with this and I'll address it. But at the same time, I don't want anyone to feel like, and I said feel, because everything's all about feelings sometimes when it comes to the narcissist. But we have feelings too, empaths, uh, codependents, and all of us other seemingly same people with struggles. We have feelings too, but don't feel like I'm just going all in on everyone and everything as it pertains to life. And so coming from that point of view, every time that I make a video, so now that we got that out of the way, uh, I wish everyone well today and throughout the week. I hope you have a, a blessed and prosperous week. Today I want to talk about, entitle this video, I got thinking about it, and I wanted to title this video think real quick. I don't want to say it the wrong way. It helps to write notes. The narcissist wants you on their timetable. Yeah, that'll be good. The narcissist wants you on their timetable. And I thought about doing this video based on a situation, whereas uh, when I had met this monster, I uh, was employed, self-employed, doing landscaping. That's always been my go-between. Even when I worked full-time for a company, 
That's always been my fallback. And it probably always will because I just love doing lawns and landscaping. And so I didn't have a nine to five, if you will. So they thought it best. When I first met them, they didn't even have a job. They had somehow transitioned from a job that they had before and they were in the midst of looking for another job and you got to be careful when you meet someone and they're transitioning even with COVID now COVID can be used as a very valid excuse to oh because of COVID I no longer work at this job I'm looking for another job so be mindful of that I mean take it at face value but monitor what they're saying about transitioning from this to that okay so, when I met her, I wasn't physically employed by an employer. I was my own employer, self-employed. She was in, in between jobs. She had worked for this job. Uh, I won't say what it is, but it was a job that facilitated who they are uh, as narcissists. They can garner immense amounts of supply. I will say what she did. She worked at a fraternity embroidery company, if you will. They dealt with a lot of colleges. They were uh, responsible for doing the embroideries for some of the colleges in the area. And so you got to understand, this is big business because colleges are always printing out sweatshirts for their uh, their school uh, what do you call it, gift shop. And so some of these sweatshirts, I mean, with embroideries of the school's name can go for 80, 100 bucks. And now with inflation, in 2022, it's probably 120 bucks a piece, you know, depending on how well made they are and how extensive the embroidery is. So she was responsible. She was one of many employees that were responsible for going to different colleges, actually soliciting these colleges to go with them as a company to do their embroidery in upcoming months and years for special occasions. So they would, they would have employees to go out and solicit and sit down and talk to people in the colleges and try to persuade them to go with them. So that's the best way to describe that job. So it's close by my house too. So I, don't, I can only imagine what really broke the camel's back over there. I think we know. We get a good idea, but it doesn't matter at this point. I ended up talking to her and telling her, you know, I work for myself. She said, you don't need, you need to get a job where, you know, you get, you know, health insurance, this and that, blah, blah, blah. And somehow or another, I entertained the thought. Because you meet somebody, you really just want to sort of like, you don't want to be insubordinate, oppositional, defiant, everything they say. You want to, it's give and take. So, I considered it and I said, you know what? I had a friend around the corner, he had mentioned this job to me. And he said, why don't you go and check into it? And it's a job where they polish metal. It's a polishing company. The machine polishes it. You just hold the, um, you hold whatever the part is on the buffer. And he had told me, he said, this thing is just gruesome on your hands. You know, so we're talking copper tonal right here, guys, for sure. And so... I said, I don't think I want to do that because I knew a girl worked with me when I was at Walmart. She actually had to have surgery because of this copper tunnel because she was lifting all of this laundry soap. And she was very small in stature, but she would outwork the average guy. I actually saw her a couple of weeks ago. We were in Lowe's and uh, it's been many years. She's doing well, her and her family. It's nice to revisit some people that you used to work with and see that they're doing well. So anyway, I went and I said, I told her, I said, I'm going to go down there and I'm going to look into that job. Even though I know I'm probably not going to do this for a long period of time. I'm going to at least take a look at it because I didn't want to feel like I was just against the whole idea of working. And since we were coming together, two families coming together, me and my twins, her and her autistic kid. So you're doing whatever it takes, not just mentally, to comply but physically to comply with growth in a relationship, working together for the same purpose, seemingly. So I go and I apply, well, I, I go down 
to the area to where uh, I was told the job existed, which was in a business park. And so I go down and the first building I see, I don't see any name on the building, anything. I get out of my car, go inside, or I push the button because you can't go in. You have to push a button and someone comes to the front. So you gain access that way. So this young lady came to the door and I didn't really recognize her right away. But it's kind of like, I remember faces, but not names. So something felt a little familiar. So she said, hi, can I help you? And I said, well, I'm here to apply for a job. Is this a polishing company? She said, no, that's right down the hill. And I said, oh. I say, well, are you guys hiring here? If I told you how many jobs I got just by inquiring, are you guys hiring, by the way? And I didn't go in that store for that specific reason, Lowe's in particular, years ago. That's how I acquired that job. And it's just weird. When you look back, it was not weird. It's ordained. When you look back at your life and you just go in and you just nonchalantly are doing something else and you end up obtaining employment in a place that you didn't intend to apply. So in this case, when she, when I asked her, she said, uh, she said, hmm, she said, yeah, we're hiring. We got a, quite a few openings of, available. She said, you operate forklift? I said, yeah, I've operated forklift for many years. Uh, when I worked at Lowe's, a little bit at uh, Walmart, always worked shipping and receiving, so that's my thing. And she said, wow, we have an opening. We need a shipping and re or receiver for the operator or just on receiving and on first shift or second shift, but you're trained on first. And I said, uh, hmm. She said, if you want to apply, she said, I'll, I'll go get my manager and uh, let him come up and just talk to you for a little while. So what she did, she came and went and got him and came up nice gentleman. Uh, we exchanged a little bit of conversation and I told him a little bit about me. Uh, you know, a little bit too much sometimes, you know, I, well, it's never too much. Uh, being that I'm an ex-con, that's always something that, that I love to share with people because uh, even though it's 22, 23 years behind me, uh, it is something that I think is very pertinent in my life and my life development as it stands. So I share that a lot. So I told him a few things about me, and he still didn't discourage him at all. Uh, he said, okay, he said, apply uh, fill the application out, and we'll review it, and we'll let you know. So I fill it out. I don't know the gist of how long or what was specific procedure, I mean, the order in which it went after this. It's sort of like, not a blur, but just don't remember exactly. But I believe a few days went by and they called me and they asked me, could I come in and be uh, able to train on first shift at like five, six o'clock in the morning? I said, sure. So I had told her when I went and applied how it went, that I went in the wrong place. I told her, the narcissist, when I came home about the whole experience. And I told them that they told me to apply. So when I got the call, I shared that with her. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to train on first show, but I'm going to be working second show. She was like, oh, man, why you couldn't get, why you, why they can't leave you on first show? I said, because second shift is the shift that they have an opening for. They don't have an, a need for first show. There is a guy that's on first show. She said, oh, man. And to me, I was like, couldn't put it together at the point, but it was like a, little, a, little, a little very overwhelming sense of very ungrateful, unappreciation here. And I was like, wow, you know, I'm just appreciative to, you know, the fact that I got a job. You suggested I should get a job that was uh, more reliable and secure with health benefits and whatnot. And I start rattling off all the good things, and the stuff that this job would afford. And looking back, I don't know if she was just, I doubt if she was ecstatic, but I guess she, she, she listened half attentively, as they always do. And I'm just so stumped, I'm stoked about the job because 
I like the environment. It's just, you know, it's a warehouse. It's like a lot of space. And it ended up, I'm the only one that worked on second shift in my area. It was probably five to six guys that worked in this warehouse. And this warehouse is probably two football fields long, if not one and a half. So imagine the space. It was kind of like I was in my own little world, which I don't mind working with people. But nonetheless, if you work by yourself, chances of you arguing and getting in a conflict with yourself are minimal to none. So I got the job. And looking back at this, being that the narcissist wants you on their timetable, which is the subject of this conversation, I look back in hindsight, I always say 2020. I now know that the reasons why, or I believe that the reasons why they want you on their timetable, be it first shift, she only worked four hours a day, part time job. Guess what she worked, guys? She worked as a clerical desk clerk where she had the advantage to all of everyone's ins and out, coming and goings, names, address, phone numbers. Ponder what I said. Think about what I just said. Full control both visually of everybody she had to buzz people in and out they needed to gain access just like this young lady when I started that job um, at the Eloy's company and so this afforded her and this was strategic in her mind she needed me to work first shift that's why she was stressing first shift because they need to be secure about the fact that you are occupied when they're out and about so it would seem that in my mind she wanted us on the same shift so we could be home together in a good way no but she needed me home as a form of fuel supply to pay her attention because to be home alone that is a fear of abandonment that is a mental torture that a narcissist just can't overcome. They constantly need something in their presence. That's why they're always on the game Candy Crush. But behind that, they got a couple of Facebook accounts going, a couple of porn sites, dating sites, all of that. They have about four or five windows going at the same time. So I've heard from my research and listening to other survivors. And ironically, in my case, she would always be playing the Candy Crush. But I now know, looking in hindsight, she had other screens open. Because she would always sit with her back to the room. And she would always be like glancing up. like. And I used to say, man, this girl is so quiet. Obviously, I'll be quiet if I'm concentrating on something that has most of my attention and it's more important than anything that you could be doing, be a birthday party, dinner, whatever. That's not important. This is important. I'm, I'm trying to garner me more supply. So the, 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 the gist of her wanting first shift, me to have first shift, was so she and I could be on the same timetable. They're not people of order. That would seem like that would be ordered. But they're king and queens of disorder chaos so I would be home when she was home so she could probably torment me cats like me triangulate me would tell me when she came home oh I ran into this guy and he blah 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 blah, blah and it's just go the mile a minute and I was like you know okay never really mattered to me and I guess she was like oh man that didn't piss him off you're securing yourself you don't worry about that kind of stuff you hear come but I just felt like it was a lot often than not that she would bring up men and give little subtle specifics and it just sounded weird 
Because certain things, if I met a woman in the grocery store, and let's say if she kind of flirted with me, and I made my position known, really wouldn't be no reason to bring it up. They'll always let you know, oh, this guy, he was in the grocery store flirting with me. And I was like, hmm. They won't say I told him I was married. They'd be like, hmm, you know, I, was, I thought it was so funny. That's what they'd be I just thought it was so funny. And you'd be like, you did? What was so funny about it? It's like, yeah, no big deal. It's just, just the way he just kept following me everywhere I went. So anyway, you get that point. So, they want you on their same timetable because they're, they, don't have to, they don't have to worry about you when they're supposedly at work. And I now know that this girl working four hours a day. It would also, she would be off at noon. Thereby, that gave her three hours, four hours after the fact to go around and manage her other supply in the harem garage while I'm still on the clock. So that's the second reason, which I think plays a little more within the, re the re realistic uh, idea. So if it was the first idea, that's a part of it. Wanting me to be home when she was home, that's a part of it, of course. But it also garnered her three extra hours that I would have been working, and she wouldn't have. And let's just imagine if she didn't go to work on a certain day. She had the whole day. Because there were times in this relationship where she would be like, oh, call me, and like, can you pick the kids up? I'm supposed to be at work once I got trained and I went to second show. I'm supposed to be to work at... 3 o'clock to midnight is what I work. 3 p.m. to 12 o'clock midnight. So I would call her and say, I would text her or call her. She would text me this sometimes, and I remember this distinctively. And I would reach out to call her back to say, what are you thinking? I got to go to work. I got to be to work. I, it's, that's impossible. I'd be late. Unreachable. I would text her and wouldn't get a response. But I would call and wouldn't get anyone to answer. So now looking back, she was possibly very well laying in the arms of some other supply where just couldn't bring herself to getting up out of bed or wherever, up out of the woods or up out of the back seat of the car and go and be responsible for picking my children up and her, her son. So this is what I'm trying to tell you about this. They always want you on their timetable so they can manage where you're at, where you are. And that's my whole point to this video. So be mindful of this example and many others that you may be experiencing yourself. There's a slew of things that they have up their sleeve. So question everything. If it doesn't make any sense, it's nonsense. Okay? Be well, guys. Bless.